Okay, so hi, uh, my name is uh, Maxim Bosano. I'm uh, working. Hi, uh, with... My name is uh, Maxim Bosano. I'm hearing echo. Okay, now that's me. Uh, so I'm working with uh, Compute Canada. Uh, I've been I've been working with Compute Canada for uh, since, since 2012, uh, and uh, I'm located at uh, University Laval in uh, in Quebec City. Uh, all right. So uh, first, what, what is Compute Canada? So Compute Canada is a little bit like Exceed in the U.S. So it's a consortium of universities. Uh, I, uh, actually, it's a consortium of regional consortia that include university. There's uh, roughly 35 member institutions. So that's all, basically all of the major universities in, in Canada. Uh, there is about 200 technical staff spread out around the, uh, the various universities, roughly 15,000 user accounts uh, with, with a growth rate of 20% per year. Uh, we support Basically, we run supercomputers and we, uh, we support researchers, academic researchers across Canada in, in all fields. Uh, it's, uh, it's free access for any uh, academic researchers uh, in Canada. Uh, so the, our use of EasyBuild started around uh, 2015. Uh, so before that, we had roughly 30 different uh, hosting sites, so 30 different clusters, uh, 50 different clusters, sorry, all configured differently. Software was being built uh, separately on, on each cluster with uh, little overlap on, on the procedures uh, between the clusters. Uh, in uh, 2015, there was a major uh, new hardware deployment in, in Canada, so five new uh, national sites uh, were deployed uh, for a total of uh, 270,000 uh, cores, uh, uh, 2,500 GPUs, uh, uh, couple, uh, a couple of tens of petabytes of disks and, and tape. Uh, so that, that includes four major uh, cluster, uh, three, uh, three that we call uh, general purpose, that's CEDAR in Simon Fraser University, uh, Graham in uh, in Waterloo University and Beluga in, in Montreal, located at uh, Ecole de Technologie Supérieure. Um, they have various CPUs, so some Skylake, some Haswell, uh, some Cascade Lake. There are various GPUs, so we have Pascal 100, uh, Volta 100. Um, there is one cluster which uses Intel Omnipath. Uh, the other ones are using uh, InfiniBand uh, EDR. We also have one uh, called Large Parallel Cluster Niagara, which is uh, fully uh, non-blocking Dragonfly InfiniBand. So that's for uh, large parallel, uh, parallel tasks. And we have one, um, one cloud system. Uh, so basically one, one big OpenStack cloud system. And each of the main clusters have a little OpenStack partition uh, on the side for things like portals and, and stuff like that. Um, so when this uh, the, this new hardware was deployed, there was a big push to uh, uniformize uh, our practices. And so we there, there were national teams that were created. Uh, the team that I lead was in charge of software installation, uh, amongst other things. And so the main goal we set we set out was that users should have. Uh, an interface that is consistent, easy to use at all sites. And of course it, it, should, uh, it should provide the optimal performance. Uh, so that, that meant a, a couple of things and we identified a few tools to, to accomplish those goals. Uh, one of them is that it, it needs to be, the, the stack needs to be on all of, of the clusters uh, without, without effort. And so it, it means a distribution mechanism. It needs to be independent of, from the OS because those clusters are actually run by different themes of systems administrators. They could be upgraded at different times. And so we need to, to provide a stack that is independent from that as much as possible. Uh, of course, uh, things should be tracked reproducible since we are uh, 200 staff working together. Um, we need to have uh, some, some um, so some automatic way of installing software. 
And uh, since we serve so many users on so, so much different hardware, we have a very large mod uh, module stack. And so we need to be able to handle that. So we, we use a lot of the same things that uh, Alan presented uh, at Hulik. Uh, so hierarchical module, module naming scheme. Um, we also use hooks when installing and, and so forth. Uh, so for the parts that we chose, so for the distribution mechanism, we use uh, CVMFS, which is CERN Virtual Machine File System, which I will talk about in the next slide, uh, to, to get a, a stack that is independent from the OS. We have a compatibility layer, which we started using Nix, uh, but we for the next version of, uh, of our stack, we, we are using Gen2 prefix instead of Nix. For all of the scientific software layer, we use easy build only, and we use uh, LMOD with the hierarchical uh, module naming scheme. So CVMFS, the way it works is you have your da data entry point. So that's where we build the software. So we, we have a dedicated hardware to build software. Once it's built and tested on, on the build node, we publish that to what's called a stratum zero. So this is the, the master copy of, of the software repository. Uh, from this, automatically, there are a number of stratum ones uh, that will pull, will fetch the latest uh, upgrade, the, the latest version of what was published on the stratum zeros. So this, uh, we have a team that manages uh, this geographically distributed uh, infrastructure. So we have uh, multiple stratum one across Canada. And uh, I know the team is also uh, looking to put uh, some of those in the big uh, Content de delivery network uh, uh, out there, uh, and on each site, uh, so there are usually two or more squid proxies. So the way that the data, the software is distributed, is over uh, HTTPS, uh, and so the squid proxies will provide a partial cache at the site level, so that if there's a, an outage of your wide area network, it will keep working. And the client nodes also have a cache on the node, uh, so it, uh, so it, it, it is fully uh, resilient, and there's no single point of failure. Even if the stratum one disappears, uh, there's a full copy of the software on multiple stratum ones. Uh, sorry, even even if the stratum zero disappears. Uh, for the software that we install uh, on that stack, so the red box here is what's installed by a systems team. So that's the OS kernel, the daemons, the drivers, anything privileged uh, that is not distributed by our stack. Uh, then on, on the stack that we distribute, we have some uh, libraries that are also in the OS because it's needed to compile open MPI. For example, you need to have the InfiniBand library or Omnipath library. Um, this can be over, overridden at the site level uh, through LD library path or, or some, some other mechan mechanism. Then the compatibility layer, we install everything down to the libc. So make the bin utils, uh, the auto tools, all of that is installed in there. It's basically a, like a, a big bundle module, uh, which we don't install with easy build, but we provide with uh, Nix or, or Gen2. And then uh, the, the green one is mostly deprecated because we if we have two systems, so we can choose to install things in, in Nix or Gen2 or in Easy Build. Uh, we used to install some things in Nix, but we ran into issues, so now we are installing all, all of those in, in Easy Build directly. And on top of that, uh, that's the Easy Build layer. It supports multiple our CPU architectures, so we have some legacy sites that run. Uh, on hardware that is only capable of SSE 3. So we do compile for uh, all of those CPU architectures. Um, so to date, we have roughly 600, uh, 800 different scientific applications. Uh, so that's open foam is one. Uh, it, it's not one per version. Uh, if we include the permutation of the version of the software, the compiler, the tool chain, uh, the architecture, we have over 6,000 different builds. Um, this infrastructure here, we, we had the deployment of our first AVX2 cluster uh, roughly uh, in, uh, in March, uh, in March last year. Was it last year or the year before? Uh, but we were able to recompile everything for AVX512. 
uh, in, in a matter of days because we use easy build. And this is the bump that, that you see here. We also have uh, some, some, some specific uh, way of handling Python, which I, I will talk about shortly. And so this is the bump when uh, Python 3.8 was, uh, was introduced. So a few design choices or EB features that, that we use. So because of the compatibility layer, we filter out a lot of the dependencies. So M4, C, uh, CMake, et cetera, uh, those are just ignored uh, by, by our config because it uses the versions in the compatibility layer. Uh, we also have different uh, tool chains from the upstream. So all of the sites in Canada were using combinations of Intel or GCC, OpenMPI, MKL, or CUDA. There was no, not, not a lot of Intel MPI or uh, OpenBLAST. Uh, so we are not quite using FOSS nor Intel, which are the main, the, the two primary tool chains in, in easy build upstream. Uh, that means we are uh, using or abusing, you could say the try tool chain, try software version and the recently introduced try update depths options in easy build to reuse the upstream uh, easy config, but installing with, with variations. We do have a custom mono module naming scheme, which is basically a hierarchical uh, uh, naming scheme, but all in lowercase. We don't want our users to figure out, uh, to, to have to figure out uh, the, the capitalization. Uh, how do you pin SIMD level to come both app and computation, uh, computational system? Uh, so ba basically when, when we compile for the different CPU architecture, uh, all we, we enable is on GCC, it would be the M arch equals something, uh, we, which I don't know uh, of the top of my head. Uh, we, we have those uh, scripted in a, a, an EB wrapper script uh, that it, it sets the opt arc, the, the correct opt arc in easy build for the different uh, architecture. And we let uh, easy build handle the rest, basically. Uh, we completely uh, ignore version suffix. Uh, so our module names are strictly module name slash version, not, nothing else. If we do need to have different versions of it, we instead change the module name. So I, I posted something in Slack earlier. We have FFTW and we have FFTW-MPI. So that, that's how we handle it instead. Uh, the tool chains are mostly hidden. We don't use LD library path because the, in the compatibility layer, we have a linker wrapper that will automatically uh, add a uh, run path or R path uh, to, to the compiled binary. So LD library path is not uh, necessary. Uh, and I think that's it. We, I added a few more notes in the written version of the tutorial. So we do use uh, hooks uh, more and more to avoid, uh, to avoid getting, uh, to, to avoid having um, different easy configs uh, because of the same uh, um, uh, management issue uh, that, that Alan mentioned. So if we are too different, it, it because a bit of a, of a maintenance issue, sorry. Uh, so that means that you run all AVX 512 binaries if the system supports it. So the um, the, the way our stack is built uh, by default, and can you see my terminal? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when the user logs in, uh, basically we will detect what's the highest uh, set. I need to increase the font size. Okay. What, what's the highest uh, CPU instruction set that is supported on that node? And there's an environment variable that is set for that. And that will control the branch of the, of the module tree that the user will see. Uh, so on this node, it detected that it, it's AVX, uh, AVX2. Uh, we can also overwrite that. So if we have, so for example, uh, our CDAR cluster has AVX2, but also AVX512. So by default, they set it to AVX2 because that works on all of the node, but users, uh, we, we provide, uh, we, we provide uh, special modules uh, called the ARC modules and users can switch 
uh, for example, load the AVX512. So if I load that, uh, now because of the hierarchy, it will reload a bunch of modules. And if I now look at uh, which MPI exec, for example, this is the branch uh, for AVX512 uh, module. Uh, uh, so I see there was a question, how, how do you make sure the software is uh, optimized for the hardware? Well, well yes, uh, we do build it uh, uh, X times. Uh, so this is for our uh, older stack, the very newest stack, which is the, the 2021. Uh, so we have uh, different, and I think this one is still hidden. So. I, if I look uh, at the hidden modules. Uh, so the, the 2020 stack, which is based on Gen 2 prefix rather than, than Nix for the compatibility layer, we also enabled uh, for the Intel branch, uh, we compile with fat binaries for AVX2 and AVX512 so that the same binary at runtime will pick whichever, uh, whichever set of instruction is supported. Um, that doesn't work for GCC. GCC doesn't support, I think, fat binaries unless it's changed in the most recent versions, but we do it in, uh, in 2020. Otherwise, we basically choose a good default and we let users uh, switch if, uh, if, if they are more, more experienced uh, uh, at it. Um, I did also in the written note add some uh, some things about Python. So uh, we, whenever we install Python in a module, uh, we will install it so that it works with any versions of Python. So for example, we do have a module uh, SciPy stack. I do have slides on that. I think I forgot to copy. Oh no, I, uh, I sorry. I thought uh, I thought I was done with with my things. Uh, so I, I covered that. So for the the hooks. Uh, so the and thanks, Kenneth. Uh, because we support uh, Omnipath and InfiniBand and Luster and GPFS. Uh, so our Open MPI is compiled with basically every option possible. Uh, that means quite a bit of customization from the upstream easy build. And so we inject uh, some configuration options through hooks. Um, we also uh, inject so some custom code in the module for the compiler and MPI so, uh, to, in order to support installation in the user's home directory. Uh, so because we use a hierarchy, when you lose those MPI or GCC module, it changes the module path, but it, it will also pick up module paths in the user's home directory if they are present. Um, because we redistribute our stack, uh, some parts of the Intel compiler were not allowed to redistribute. So we need to split the installation to two different uh, uh, CVMFS repository, one which is private to Compute Canada and the other one which is open. Uh, so we do that with, with the hooks. Uh, we also strip down Python modules. Uh, so our Python module is bare with very minimal extensions. And uh, we, we use a different mechanism and that, that's true. Uh, I have stacks, uh, slides on, on that. So we do install Python wrappers, for example, PyQt, we install that with Qt, OpenCV Python, we install it with OpenCV. And we will use multi depths, which actually was uh, contributed by Compute Canada to, to handle that. Uh, but we are not installing most Python packages as, as modules. Uh, instead, we use what's called Python wheels, and I have a slide on that. We also not su don't support Anaconda at all on our wiki. It basically tells user don't install Anaconda. Uh, so what, what are Python wheel? They are basically binary packages that you can compile uh, against your own stack. So for example, we have a, a Python wheel for NumPy, which is linked against our version of MKL that we provide with the stack. Uh, same thing for H5Pi, which is compiled against uh, HDF5. 
And then we direct users to create the virtual environment and run pip install, whatever they need. And we let pip handle all of the Python dependency uh, um, things. That also has the advantage of uh, having users not so dependent on updating a software because there was a there was a bug found or something they, they install it and, and it, it stays there uh, and you can use this stack too because we built it to be portable uh, it's uh, publicly accessible on our wiki we it, it takes about five minutes to get it running running on a, on a vm or on a, on a cluster it will take you a bit more time because you need to have a uh, um, uh, squid proxies, but otherwise in a VM, it's a matter of minutes. You install a few packages, a few uh, configuration files, and you have the whole stack available and it run on Ubuntu, Red, uh, Red Hat, uh, CentOS uh, 6 or, or 7, if you want to use the Gen 2 uh, stack. Uh, we've tested it on Fedora, OpenSUSE, e even on Windows, if you have a Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, that, that works too. Uh, and yes, I think I'm probably out of time. And I, that's all of the slides I have. Thank you very much, Maxime. My ple pleasure. Any more questions? I don't see any additional questions popping up. Uh, we do have hopefully some time for questions at the very end. So anyone has questions, please raise them and we can get back to them. And I'll try to zip through the rest of the tutorial 